Okay, we are still in Act 1, Scene 1. I think it is Scene 1. No, it's Scene, scene three. 3. Scene 3. Richard vanishes. Bolingbroke and Mowbray, or Hereford and Mowbray. Henry Bolingbroke is Duke of Hefford, as it's pronounced, and Thomas Mowbray is Duke of Norfolk. All right. So he tells... Henry Bolingbrook, Brook, line uh, da, 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 141, till twice five summers. He gets a 10-year banishment. Then he tells Norfolk, yours is a little worse. Thy slow hours shall not determinate the, de the dateless limit of thy dear exile. Dateless limit. It has no end. Okay. So Mowbray goes on that speech we briefly discussed the other day about, you know, you're going to banish me from my native tongue. I won't be able to go anywhere where, native, where English is the native language. He's essentially saying, you might as well kill me now. Okay? And Richard says, quit your whining. That's the, he puts thee not to be compassionate and such. Okay? So... Mowbray starts kind of to leave dejectedly, and Richard calls him back, and he makes them both put their hands on his sword and utter this oath. Swear by the duty that you owe to God, our part therein we banish with uh, yourselves, to keep the oath that we administer. Here's the oath. You never shall, so help you truth and God, embrace each other's love in banishment. I don't want you to be reconciled in your exile. Why not? I mean, if he's a quote-unquote good Christian king, shouldn't he want them to patch up their differences and live happily ever after out there? <laughs> Why doesn't he want them to unite? So they don't like rise up against him. <laughs> exactly. So they don't conspire against him. What does this tell you about Richard? Is he a little paranoid? Okay, or is he is paranoid? Possibly. What else? He knows them well enough to know that there could be plots against him. Is but is this kind of a canny act? I mean, is this is there an element of prudence in this? Yeah, he's protecting himself. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, there is that element, too. I don't want you guys getting together and essentially comparing notes and then coming back and doing justice against me. So, not to embrace each other's love and banishment, nor ever look upon each other's face, never see each other, nor never write, ne regret, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your homebred hate. I want you to, in Mowbray's case, die hating Henry Bolingbroke. Nor, and now he gets to the real purpose, never by advice and purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot. Complot means plot together. Any ill against us, who's the us? It's the royal we, me, our state, England, our subjects, my people, or our land. Okay. Bolingbroke swears. Mowbray swears. Bolingbroke has a few words to Norfolk. Notice what he tells him to do before they part. Confess thy treasons ere thou fly the realm, since thou hast far to go. Bear not along the clogging burden of a guilty soul. What does this tell you about Henry Bolingbroke? Notice, compare this with Richard's just previous speech. What does he want Thomas Mowbray to do? Confess. Why? To admit it to the king? No. It's the to bear not along the clogging burden of a guilty soul. Look at your gloss. A clog was a wooden block attached to the leg to hinder movement. Not a very helpful gloss. 
it's kind of helpful. What would the guilt that Bolingbroke says Norfolk has, what would that do to his soul? It hurt it a lot, weigh it down. It weighs it down. It, what is the soul's, quote unquote, natural destination, according to people like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates? Not as much Aristotle, Plato and Socrates, definitely. And the medieval Christian theologians. It's with God. But it's kind of hard to get that soul to rise to God when it's being dragged down by this heavy clog. What's the clog? Guilt. How do you get rid of guilt? Confess. Bolingbroke is concerned, seemingly, I will add, for Thomas Mowbray's eternal salvation. Now, does that sound like somebody who's necessarily full of hate and spite? If you're full of hate and spite towards somebody, do you want them to confess and be with Jesus for all eternity? Not really. Mowbray. No, Bolingbroke. That is, no, I'm not going to confess here now. If ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life. If I was ever a traitor, may God, that's my name be blotted from the book of life. May God be my judge and send me directly to hell. That's a pretty powerful oath, right? Especially if you believe in the reality of everything behind it. God, book of life, eternal salvation, and such. And I from heaven banished as from hence. That's pretty much his confession. I am not a traitor. I, what's he saying in those few words? I did not conspire against Thomas of Gloucester. I was not responsible for his death. Okay. That is directly. But what thou art, God, thou, and I know. What art thou? Well, look at the next line. And all too soon I fear the king shall rue. What is Thomas Mowbray suggesting about Henry Bolingbroke? What motivates Henry Bolingbroke? Revenge. No, not revenge. Power. Power. Ambition. He is ambitious. That's what Mowbray is suggesting. That you want more than what you have. So, farewell, my liege. Now, no way I can I stray. Say back to England, all the world's my way. So he leaves. Richard speaks to John of Gaunt. And he says, Even in the glasses of thine eyes, I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years. Notice, Mowbray leaves. He's out. He's gone. And then Richard turns to John of Gaunt, Bolingbroke's father, and says, because of the sad visage of your face, I'm going to take four years off. He'll only be banished six years. What's kind of the implication? You'll see him again. It won't be long. Six years will go by quickly. And believe me, the older you get, the faster time flies. Einstein was entirely right about the relativity of time. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters. And then you can return with welcome. Okay. So there's a couple more speeches. And Gaunt says, towards the end of his long wind, yeah, but I'll be long dead before he comes back. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. Now, is Richard saying that seriously or facetiously? Facetious. Yeah, he's being facetious there. Gaunt, not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Shorten my days thou canst with sullen sorrow and pluck nights for me, but not then tomorrow. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, but stop no wrinkle in his pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death. 
The dead, thy kingdom, cannot buy my breath. Right? What's God really getting at there? This banishment will eat away my time. And you can't add any more life to me. Richard, um, why at our justice seemst thou then to lower? Why are you frowning at my declaration of justice? Things sweet to taste prove in digestion sour. Look at which one is it? I mean, you don't have to look at it. Just make a note of it. Look at it later. Oh, there it is. Sonnet 129. Okay. Just make a note of it. Look at it. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. Until action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner. Okay. Lust. Once it is fulfilled, once it is acted out, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. Things sweet to taste. Proven digestion sour. You urged me as a judge. He was part of the council that Richard said came up with this penalty, banishment. But I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Notice there, Gaunt is saying that as I was sitting as an advisor of state, what did he have to remove, essentially, from himself? Instincts to protect his son. His fatherhood over his son. His love for his son. Why? Because if he was concerned about Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of Norfolk, Duke of um, Hereford, as his son, he wouldn't be acting as what kind of judge? Impartial. So, Richard and his group leave, and we get a little scene with Gaunt and Bolingbroke. And Gaunt says to Bolingbroke, what did six winners? They're quickly gone. Two men enjoy? That is, when you are really enjoying life, boom, goes by fast. But grief makes one hour ten. Why? Because of fortune's wheel. The goddess fortune, according to the ancients, but more so the medieval world, ruled over our lives, ruled over the world. Behind her, by the way, stood fate, especially in the Greco-Roman kind of understanding. And she had this wheel, and this wheel was the Wheel of Fortune. That's where the title of the game show comes from, by the way. And she's always spinning this wheel. And where you are on that wheel determines your perception of how fast that wheel is spinning. Because when you're down here, it seems like what? Yeah, time has stopped. And things will never get better. But once it starts to, it's always moving. But once time seems to speed up, in other words, once you move from this point to this point, life's starting to improve a little bit. And then you get to this point, it's a little bit better. You get to this point, things are looking up. You get to this point, you're rocking it. You get to this point, you're on top of the world. You don't want to get to that point. Because what happens then? It's not that the wheel keeps turning. It's like this half of the wheel disappears. And you go, ah! And you go right back down to go to jail. Don't pass go. To go directly to jail. And then you have to spin the wheel to see if you get out of jail. Okay? That's why 
to men and joy, up here it goes what? It goes quickly. Call it a travel that thou takes for pleasure. No, 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 you're not banished. You're on the grand tour. You're, you're going to, you know, visit the various European countries. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. See, pilgrimage is something you want to do. Pilgrimage should not be something you're forced to do. How can you be forced to go see a quote-unquote holy site? Where's the devotion in that? There is none. Gaunt, the solemn passage of thy weary steps, is steam as foil, wherein thou art set to return the precious jewel of thy home return. <clears throat> Think of your banishment then as, literary term, a foil for when you return. A thing that will bring out your real internal characteristics. So, what is God trying to do to his son at this point? Just try to make him feel better. Make him feel better. Come on, son, suck it up. This is the coach. Halftime. You're down. 89-0. <laughs> Come on, you can do this. And Bolingbroke's like, no, all I see is darkness ahead. All places that the eye of heaven visits, line 275, are to a wise man ports and happy havens. What the hell does that mean? All places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man, notice, got to keep that word wise, ports and happy havens. Well, what's the eye of heaven? Pull out a dollar bill. What do you have on the back? And you have the all-seeing eye. What? Which one was it? Emerson or Thoreau? Referred to, called the all-seeing eye. Okay? Why? Why is God's eye, metaphorically speaking, all-seeing? It kind of gets back to this, because where is God in this scheme? Way up here. Because this scheme gets Christianized in the late classical period by a Roman author by the name of Boethius, who wrote a little book called The Consolation of philosophy. He doesn't mean, you know, pick up some Wittgenstein or pick up some Derrida or pick up Leibniz or Spinoza or pick your famous philosopher and you'll suddenly feel better. No. For Boethius, the consolation of philosophy, I don't usually go off on this in this poem, but what the hell. <laughs> the consolation of philosophy was written because Boethius was good friends with the emperor at the time, the Roman emperor, okay, who was Theodoric, Germanic, okay, and Boethius was accused of plotting against the emperor. Now again, they were good friends. Theodoric believed the accusation, threw him in prison. Didn't just throw him in prison, put him on death row. This was capital crime. So while he's waiting for his sentence to be carried out, he writes his book. He writes his book within the fiction of, while he's in prison, the goddess philosophy, which means what? Philosophy? Love of wisdom. The goddess philosophy comes to him, and she teaches him how to understand the answer to the classic question, why do bad things happen to good people? And she doesn't say, oh, Bo, you know, it's not so bad. This is a good prison. No, she doesn't do that. She says, essentially, suck it up, man. Everything will all work out. She doesn't mean by that you will go back home. You will live the Disney life happily ever after. She means everything will all work out because 
Everything that we see in the world is all working according to a giant cosmic plan of sorts. But not a plan in that God, the, the kind of the deistic God, let's say, of Thomas Jefferson, created the universe like a giant watch. Everything, all part of little gears moving and all moving perfectly and then threw it off into space and said, you're on your own. No. For the goddess of philosophy in Boethius's fiction, God is up here, okay, looking down on the whole universe. But there are fate involved and fortune is involved. Fortune governs everything down here. Fate goes beyond down here. Fate includes things like comets and meteors and space and such. <coughs> in the Greek system, you had fate, and then kind of equal to fate, off to this side, not the pop quiz, the gods. The gods did not control fate. The gods could see fate, but they didn't control it. They couldn't change it. It's almost like fate's behind the gods, but not really, such that in the play Oedipus the King, what's the problem? What, what must Oedipus confront? His fate. What is his fate? To kill his father and marry his mother. Kill his father and marry his mother. How does he learn of that fate? A Not a ghost. The gods. The oracle at Delphi, the mouth of Apollo, says, you're fated to kill your father and sleep with your mother. And he's like, like hell. And so he runs away from home. <coughs> realizing he's been adopted. So if you ever adopt children, make sure you know that so that they don't, you know, accidentally pull an Oedipus on Because you. you don't want that to happen, obviously. So God's out here. So what does that mean, God's out here? God, eyeball, get me some, you know. This is time as we know it. Where does time be begin for us? Our birth, right? That's when it starts happening. Or use the hourglass image. Just before you're born, that hourglass is full, right? Because all the sand's down here. And the moment you're born, what happens? Yeah. That's why I say, you know, the moment you're born is when you start dying. Because each one of those grains, it's a little bit of life draining away from you. Okay? So, how do we experience time, though? Contra a lot of science fiction nonsense. Linearly. Linearly. Moment by moment, right? You can't go back and relive yesterday. Can't go back in time. Notwithstanding J.K. Rowling's stupid little time turner. The most <laughs> idiotic thing she did in the entire seven book series. Okay? Or H.G. Wells' time machine. You can't go back. Can you go forward? Yes, you do. Every moment. That's stepping forward. Can you go two steps forward? Only after you take the first one. Okay. So we experience time this way. For how many of you is your lives in this experience of time this way? Absolutely wonderful and beautiful. Every moment of your existence. I mean, every moment of your life is like a Renoir painting. Or a Degas or a Rembrandt. Yeah, I didn't think so. For how many of you is it like the underside of that painting? Or take a beautiful tapestry, something that is woven, and flip it over. The back looks like what? A jumble of thread. Makes It's a Jackson Pollock painting, as opposed to a Rembrandt. Rembrandt would look at Pollock and go, my God, man, what is wrong with you? That is utter... <laughs> okay? Because it's what? non representational. You can't make any sense out of it. You look at Rembrandt, and you understand very clearly. Horse, man, woman, street, etc. So, we see time this way as just kind of a series of data points. What do we not see? I use that term data point intentionally. What do we not see of those data points? Louder. The future? Nope. I thought you said something else that ended with a chur. The picture frames that they create. 
I mean, he's another artist. I don't remember his name, but he was the founder of the pointillist movement. Not where you make brush strokes, but you do Surat. Um, it's got two or three very, very famous paintings. One's a bunch of people standing at the seashore. And the paintings are dots of paint. Okay? If you take those dots, put them under a magnifying glass, all you see is dots. You've seen this on your computer screens. People have done collages of thousands of images. You zoom in, you get a little image. You zoom back out, and you get the big picture. What's the point? God sees time how? As one. What C.S. Lewis called the eternal present. Think about that meaning for a moment. Georges Surratt? Yeah, Georges Surratt. Yeah. Right? The eternal present. What does eternal mean? E, X, outside, eternal, of time. Present. Present means within time. So the outside of time, in time. Why? According to Boethius and later Christian theologians, all this for God is simply... Everything. That's why the St. Paul can say, you know, from the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified. What do you mean? He's hanging there on the cross, you know, somewhere deep down in the bowels of the earth? No. It's that at the moment of creation, God saw what? The end of creation. Notice, I used the wrong verb there. I said saw. Past tense. Seeds. Seeds. So philosophy taught him you're short sighted. You're near sighted. You need to take the long view. Why? Because what does Romans 8:28 say? For those who believe in God, everything works out. Okay? Well, Boethius was a Christian. So act like it. Essentially, philosophy was teaching him. Now, again, that's all a fiction. Philosophy didn't really come to him. This is him sitting there and wondering, why the hell did this happen to me? I'm a good Christian. Well, crap happens to good people, right? Happens to bad people, too. But sometimes really good things happen to bad people. And really bad things happen to good people. That's what he's wrestling with. So, what did Gaunt mean? All places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man. What? Ports and happy havens. Wherever you are, guess what? Two things. One, God sees, and that means what? God is there, wherever that is. That might be in prison. That might be on a ship going down to the bottom of the ocean, etc. But it is a port Okay, so what's the big deal about a port? It's an opportunity. Okay, it's an opportunity. Not an airport, because obviously they didn't have airports. A seaport. Why is a seaport important? It's a place of safety. Because when you're out on the open ocean, you got sea swells and everything. Especially this time of year in the Atlantic or the Pacific. You know, one of the buoys out in the Atlantic registered 83 foot waves under Hurricane Florence. You want to find a safe haven. You want to find a port, a place to go in and go, ah, oh, terra firma. Okay? But that's only to the wise man. All right? Therefore, teach thy necessity to reason thus. Thy necessity. You can't escape this. You have to do this. This is for you, fate. There is no virtue like necessity. What does virtue mean? 
Is it virtue like love, faith, loyalty, friendship? No. It has here its old meaning of power. But it does incorporate those kind of other things like a positive human attribute. Necessity, in other words, Gaunt is saying, that can't be good. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. No, that's dangerous language, if you think about it. How in the world can you banish the king? Okay, what does that do to the power structure? Totally inverts it. Just even kind of mentioning those three words, banish the king. In Shakespeare's day, that's dangerous. Queen Elizabeth, in the 1590s, literally had writers' tongues cut out, had their fingers cut off, so that they couldn't speak and they couldn't write, because there were people speaking and writing against her. Primarily Catholics. She got to be as bad towards Catholics as her half-sister was towards Protestants 40 years earlier. Go, say I sent thee forth to purchase honor, and not the king exiled thee. So, wherever you go, don't tell people you've been banished. Tell them your father, my father sent me to do what? Find honor. He doesn't mean purchase it like shell out a few pounds, you know, and buy honor. To purchase honor. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air. Is he saying, go and lie to everybody? No. Can he purchase honor even though he's been banished? Sure. He can go, quote unquote, do glorious deeds. Is there a pestilence that hangs in the air of England? Well, according to some perspectives, there is, and that pestilence has a name. As we saw with Theseus in Midsummer Night's Dream, the imagination of the poet, lover, and madman are all compact, right? What does the poet do? He gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Okay? So what name might pestilence take? How about Richard? And thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look what thy soul holds dear. Imagine it to lie that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it. If you let sorrow take hold of you, tomorrow will be worse than today, right? But if you mock it, if you laugh at it, if you kind of slough it off, it doesn't hurt you. Bolingbroke. Who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty Caucasus? Okay, Dad, smarty pants, here's what you're saying. Light a fire, pick it up with my hand, and think, oh, it's not hot because I'm in the Caucasus Mountains where it's cold and snowy and icy, and yet my flesh is burning. In other words, the mind can't alter reality. John Milton is famously going to write, put in the mouth of Satan, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Why? Because the mind itself can make a hell of heaven a heaven of hell. How? What does it all have to do with? Perspective. Get back to this. This is God's perspective. Our perspective is this. Okay. But if we can widen that perspective a little bit, our perspective is, is in fact even narrower than this. It's what? It's this. It's determined by who I am, where I was born, what family I was born into, what country I was born into, and that's one of the values of literature, right? Because it allows us to develop a perspective a little bit wider. Because I read things written not by me. 
because I know stuff written by me. It's boring and crap. But this isn't. And Sophocles isn't, etc. Or Chloe, the Hungry Edge of Appetite, by bare imagination of a feast. You ever been really, really hungry and started to think about food? Does that starting to think about food make the hunger go away? No, just the opposite. Or wallow naked in December snow by thinking on fantastic summer's heat. No, the apprehension of the good. There's the imagination does what? Apprehends some good more than cool reason comprehends it. The apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. The apprehension, the thinking about it, he is saying, makes the present situation even worse. Gaunt, come on, time to go. All right? So, one four. We hear Richard, uh, let's see here, 23. Ourself and Bushy Badgett here in green observed his courtship to the common people. Um, who's he talking about? Who's his courtship? Bowling Brooks. And it's pronounced Bowling Brook, not Bowling Brook, right? Bowling Brooks. How he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy. What reverence he did throw away on slaves, wooing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles and patient underbearing of his fortune, is twere to banish their effects with him. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench, his hat to a woman digging oysters. The implication is either at the seashore or in the Thames, low tide. So why would Henry... Duke of Hereford doffed his hat to a woman digging oysters. What's he showing, possibly? Being humble. Humility? Respect? That's a sign of respect. Another Harry Potter reference. I teach, of course, on Tolkien and Harry Potter. I Every now and then, I used to, every other summer, I used to teach a course in London on Harry Potter. The very end of the seventh book, there's the epilogue. We see somebody tip his hat to Harry. Who is it? Anybody know? It's Malfoy. Draco. Why is that significant? They were enemies. That's a mark of respect. Are they drinking buddies? Nope. Okay. So, he is saying what about Bolingbrook? The commoners love him. In other words, Richard's subjects love Bolingbrook. A brace of Draymond bid God speed him well. And had the tribute of his supple knee. Henry got down and knelt to them. That is a mark of humility. With thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends. By calling the common draymen his countrymen and his friends, what is Henry doing with the whole social order? He's leveling. <coughs> as were our England in reversion his and he our subjects next degree in hope next degree in hope next in line future king well he is gone Green says and with him go these thoughts in other words we don't need to worry about that now because you banished him for six years I kind of think Henry uh, Richard is thinking at this point Maybe I should have done it the other way. Maybe he should have been banished for life. So, Richard says, we're going to go off to this war. What war? Irish wars. 
if you're not familiar with it, almost from the time the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes, the Germanic tribes, arrived in Britain in 450 AD, they've been waging war against the Irish. There's a reason why the Irish hate the English. There's a reason why the Scots hate the English. Okay, And it's because you're always trying to conquer. So he goes on. For our coffers, with too great a court and liberal largesse, are grown somewhat light. Notice what Richard admits here. The royal treasury is somewhat light. Empty. Why? Because of the wars? No. Liberal largesse and too great a court. Too great a court doesn't mean he's working on building Windsor Castle. Too great a court means he's got too many followers. And liberal largesse means he's too generous. He's just handing out money like it's candy. And therefore, the royal treasury is empty. So, we are enforced to farm our royal realm. The revenue thereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. Line 45. Farm. Lease the right of collecting taxes for a present cash payment to the highest bidder. So it's like holding an auction. He's going to lease the right to levy taxes, let's say, from a shire or county, to whoever promises him the highest amount. I will raise 100,000 pounds for you. The king says, OK, gives that person the right to do that. What does that then, so that person then gives 100,000 pounds to the king for his wars. What is that person now able to do? And usually this is already somebody who's wealthy and high standing, a duke or something. Collect taxes from the poor people. How much? 100,000 pounds worth? As much as he wants. Okay. If that comes short... Our substitutes at home shall have blank charters. That is, my representatives shall have blank charters. That's like blank checks. To do what? Or to, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after to supply our wants. Okay? Bushy comes in and says, John of God is grievous sick on his deathbed. Where? At his house. Come on, God. Put it in the physician's mind to help him to his grave immediately. You know, up his morphine dose just a little bit. Just send him over. Why? The lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Now, he's filthy rich. And his son is banished. And his son is banished. So he's saying, we will take the money from his coffers. Now, literally, the lining of his coffers is the felt or velvet lining inside, quote-unquote, treasure chest. By saying we will take that and make coats for our soldiers, he's telling us he's got a lot of these coffers or chests. Enough to make clothing for all his soldiers. It's a metaphor, right? So, Gaunt comes in, 2-1, with his brother, the Duke of York. And they talk a little bit. York says, you know, don't, don't worry about the king. Gaunt. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Deep harmony. Think the opening chords of Beethoven's Fifth. Think the opening music of Jaws. Boom. Notice it's not. Beep, 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 beep. Totally ruins it. Okay? Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. I want Richard to come here, why? So I can give him my dying words, and hopefully he'll pay attention. Though Richard, my life's, count, my life's counsel, would not hear, my death said tale may yet undeaf his ear. Maybe my dying breath will make him listen.
925. I keep thinking we get out of this class at 905, and I'm thinking, I'm screwed. <laughs> um, York, no. No. You will not undeaf his ear. Why? It is stopped with other flattering sounds. Stopped means all he hears are what he wants to hear. Yes, your majesty. Right, your majesty. Wonderful idea, your majesty. This is why modern political situation, you want a president to staff his or her cabinet with pretty strong people. I mean, I'll just go out on a limb here and say people who could essentially take that job and shove it. Like, for example, and I'm not saying he's the only one who's had people like this. If, if these two people in Trump's cabinet were to ever quit or be fired, I would be extremely worried. General Mattis or General Kelly. Why? Because these guys have both seen the fog of war. They both know what's really important. They're not, you know, uh, penthouse billionaires. Okay. And they are two people. I don't know about all the others. I'll take that back. Nikki Haley seems to have a pretty thick skin and can tell them what for. They, you know, seem to be two that, you know, will essentially give them full barrels. But that's not usually the case. Usually the people that are appointed cabinet members <coughs> are quote-unquote yes-men, sycophants. They go along with whatever the leader wants. Flattering sounds as praises of whose taste the wise are fond. Lascivious meters, that is, pretty songs. But the lascivious doesn't only mean pretty. What else does lascivious imply? If somebody is lascivious... They're sexually impure or unchaste or raunchy. Okay. He's talking about dirty love poems. There's a whole branch of poetry in the Middle Ages written and sung by the Goliards. Goliardic poetry. Think of this as horny 20-year-old you know, college students walking around singing dirty love lyrics. And I mean dirty. Dirty, dirty love lyrics. Most of them were in Latin. <laughs> you translate them to the English, though, and... To whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. The open ear of youth, he's talking about Richard. Richard likes this stuff. Not just the dirty songs. But the voices of all these others, why? What are they doing to him? They're elevating him. They're flattering him. Report of fashions in proud Italy. That's one of the things they're talking about. Whose manners still our tardy apish nation limps after in base imitation. Now, Shakespeare puts this in the mouth of a character in 1398. There wasn't a whole lot of imitation of Italy in 1398. There was some. Dante was really big. Chaucer was heavily influenced by Dante. Okay? But in the 1590s? Oh, yeah. The English were in awe of Italy. And in fact, it wasn't only the 1590s. It's all the way up to the about 1900. Read an awful lot of late Victorian and early 20th century literature, and what are people doing who have the money? They're going on holiday. Where? To Italy. You know, E.M. Forster's Room with a View. Where's the room? It's in Italy. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity, so it be new, there's no respect, how vile. Where the world doth thrust forth a vanity, a little bobble, like a little something shiny, a piece of bling. Doesn't matter how new it is. That is not quickly buzzed into his ears. If Richard were alive today, he would be on this thing 24-7. 
and every new little interesting tidbit he'd be all over or every you know the qvc shopping network he'd be sitting there just ordering and the england debit card would the numbers would be running off of that sucker all right god he thinks i am a prophet new inspired and thus expiring do foretell of him his rash fierce blaze of riot cannot last notice rash fierce blaze <coughs> All that implies what? He's got a temper. No. The riot doesn't mean anger. Riot means uncontrolled living. Rash. Louder. Living above his means. Living above his means. What else? What's it better to be? A sun or a you know red giant that lives billions of years. Or a meteor that does what? Psst. Burns out in a blaze of glory. It's a blaze. It attracts your attention. But it is short-lived. It cannot last. For violence, fires soon burn out themselves. Consuming means soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, and we get one of the most beautiful passages in all of Shakespeare's plays. Gaunt is talking about England. Me, you know, American, merry old England. But listen to what he says. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, the island is the throne of kings. Not the stone of scone in Westminster Abbey today. Okay? Comes from Ireland. It comes from Scotland, by the way. This earth of majesty. The island. The, the very earth is what he's talking about. This seat of Mars. Why Mars? Why not Venus? God of war. Don't mess with England. Sounds better with Texas because it rhymes. You know, but... This other Eden. Demi paradise. This fortress built by na nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. Now, from the English point of view, that would be <laughs> France. Because you can't be happy being French because the French are lower than we are. I mean, just pure native uh, prejudice there. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb, teeming. There's just all kinds of children getting ready to be born. This teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth. Why are they feared by their breed? He's talking about his family lineage. Going back to Edward III, going back before him, before him, all the way back to Henry I. Feared by their breed, famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds, as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre and stubborn jury of the world's ransom, blessed Mary son, that is, for their martial prowess on the Crusades. 200 years before this is about the last one. Okay. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. This sceptered isle, this demi paradise, this other Eden. Like Adam left Eden, handed the keys to over somebody and said, keep it for me but you, know, you got to pay me rent on it, is now leased out. 
I die pronouncing it like to a tenement or a pelting farm. If it's leased out, then what does that make the king? Simply a landlord. Any of you ever have problems with landlords? There's a reason why the very term immediately kind of suggests, huh? England, bound in with the triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame. Shame has become the great wall to surround England with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. The parchment bonds, he's talking about like bonds today, when a city issues a bond so that it can purchase stuff that what? It doesn't have the money for. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. The scandal vanish with my life. How happy then were my ensuing death. He's like, if I could wipe all this away with my life, I would die now. <laughs> so, the king comes in with his followers. And the king asks him, how is it with aged Gaunt? What does he really mean? Damn, you're still alive? Let you die, old man. God says, within me grief hath kept a tedious feast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt? So he starts punning on his name. For sleeping England long time, long time have I watched. Watching breeds leanness, leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast, I mean my children's looks. And therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Why? Because you sent my son away. Gaunt am I for the grave, gaunt as a grave, etc. Richard, can sick men play so nicely with their names? In other words, you must have a few more years left in you because of the fact that you can riddle this way. No. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. How does he seek to kill his name in him? By banishing his son. Notice, what is Gaunt assuming? If I die now, what happens to the Duke? What's he Duke of? Duke of Lancaster. What happens to the Dukedom of Lancaster? Well, it should be inherited by his son. But where is his son? Banished for six years. So what's going to happen to his land and holdings and houses? And it shouldn't. Not according to the English law, it shouldn't. So, God says, I diest. And then he says, no, thou diest, though I the sicker be. Richard, like, what? What do you mean, I die? I am in health. <laughs> I breathe. And I see you ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill. Ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick. Reputation. How important is reputation? It's the most important. Take my 3010 course, and we, you know, talk about the wonder of the seafarer, and then we get to Beowulf. It's everything. And as we saw even earlier in here, why are Mowbray and Bolingbroke just ready to go out and hammer and tongs? Because Bolingbroke slandered Norfolk's honor. And he says, you can't make me throw the gauge back down because in doing so, the slander that he uttered at me lives. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let my reputation be stained. Hereford said, uh, excuse me, Norfolk said. So, he says, the land is your deathbed, and you lie there, why? 
because you are in reputation sick. That means the people are doing what? They don't like you. <laughs> what should have been, you know, the first giveaway of that? Their conversation about Bolingbrook. He says... And thou, too careless patient as thou art, commits thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. The reason your reputation is sick is what? The flatterers, your circle of advisors. So you want to start making yourself well, great king? Do what? Fire everybody around you. Get rid of the, how's he call it? The too great a court. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown. Well, where's the crown sit? On his head. Whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet encage it in so small a verge. The waist is no whit lesser than thy land. O had thy grandsire... Edward III, with a prophet's eye, seeing how his son's son should destroy his sons. Now that his sons might be God's slightly elusive accusation that Richard killed Thomas of Gloucester. Edward's son. Edward III's son. Or it might mean that Richard is responsible for the death of the quote-unquote sons of England through, for example, civil war. To destroy his sons, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing... It's the first time we've seen the word deposing thee. Before thou wert possessed. All right? That is, Edward III would have stopped you from becoming king. Why? Because up until this point, nobody had ever deposed a king. D, out away from, pose, position. Okay. Not deposed like in a court proceeding, where you have to go and be Deposed about what you know about something. Deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. How can you depose yourself? According to King Lear, you can abdicate. Guess what? In the 1390s, as much as in the 1590s, when Shakespeare's writing this play, you can't abdicate. A king or queen cannot give up the job. That's why it's only happened once in English history. With Edward VII. 1938? 39? In love with an American divorcee, Mrs. Sim Wallace Simpson, wants to marry her. English law says you can't. He's the eldest son of George V, and he abdicates almost on the threshold of World War II. His brother's trying to talk him out of it because he doesn't want to be king, because he doesn't think he can be king, because he stutters. Okay. And Edward, you know, chooses love. We also now know he was a bit of a Nazi sympathizer. That's putting it a little lightly, by the way. So, which art possessed now to depose thyself. He is saying, by your actions, you are doing this. Why? Because you're not acting kingly. You not, might not be legally doing this, but your very actions are making it impossible for people to view you as the king. Why, cousin, 
wert thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease. To let. Go to England today, to let. To let. To let. All over buildings. What does it mean? To rent. Right? But for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it? So, land lord of England art thou now not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law. And Richard's just, he's had enough. A lunatic, lean, witted fool. Notice the pun. Lean, gaunt, witted. Fool, presuming on an ague's privilege. That is, you're talking like this because you're assuming that because you're sick, I'm going to let you get away with talking like this. No. Darest with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek? Are you trying to frighten me? Chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence? Now by my seat's right royal majesty. Wert thou not brother to great Edward's son? Great Edward's son, my father. If you weren't the brother of my father, this tongue that, ran, that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. If you weren't my daddy's brother, I'd rip that tongue out, wrap it around your throat, and cut your head off with it. Spare me not, my brother Edward's son. For that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already like the pelican, hast thou topped out, tapped out, and drunkenly caroused. There is an old myth that pelicans ate their young. That blood already, like the pelican, that is, the blood that ran through Edward III, the blood that ran through Edward the Black Prince, God's brother, that blood already, like the pelican, hast thou tapped out, tapped Barkeeps were called tapsters. Why? Because they go and they tap a hole in the side of a barrel. Or like tapping a maple tree to get the maple syrup from it. You have put a tap in your uncle, he says. My brother Gloucester, plain, well-meaning soul, whom fear befall in heaven... Notice, just mentioning, may God have peace, you know, bless his soul, essentially. That thou may be a precedent and witness good, that thou respects not spilling Edward's blood. He's just accused the king of killing his uncle, the king's uncle. Join with the present sickness that I have, and thy unkindness be like crooked age, to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. He's kind of saying, King, your time's running out. Like his son offered to Norfolk, he offers the king the opportunity to do what? Confess. Repent. Don't die with this shame on your head. And he gets borne off by his attendants. Why? Because he's so sick he can't even walk. Let them die that age and sullens have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave. The York says, no, don't, don't, don't listen to him. Don't, John's, you know, he's not up to him. He's not feeling well. Right? Northumberland comes in. First time we've seen Northumberland. And Northumberland says, Old Gaunt commends him to your majesty. What says he? Well, nothing. All is said. In other words, uh, he's dead. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life, and all old Lancaster hath spent. York. Be York the next that must be bankrupt so. York saying, oh God, take me now. York's as old as Gaunt. Actually, he's born... Either a year younger or a year older. Right? 
Though death be poor, it ends immortal woe. So what does Richard say? Therefore, since God is dead, I take it all. Everything he has. Towards our assistance, we do seize to us the plate, coin, revenues, and movables wherever our Uncle God did, did stand possessed. And what does York say? You can't do that. Why? How long shall thy tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hefford's banishment, nor God's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace, have ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. He's saying, I've let you do an awful lot, and I've never said anything. Anything to, what? To sour, shut up, to <laughs> cause a wrinkle in my sovereign's face? I've never done anything to make you frown. I'm the last of noble Edward's sons, Edward III, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first, the Black Prince. In war was never lion waged more fierce, blah, 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 blah. What's he getting to? Why are you king? Because you inherited it. Why am I not king? Because I wasn't in the immediate line of inheritance. He's building. Richard, what's the matter? <laughs> Seek you to seize and grip into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hefford? Is not Gaunt dead? It's a rhetorical question. And doth not Hefford live? Was not Gaunt just? And is not Harry, Hefford, Bolingbroke, true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir, uh, Gaunt, to have the heir, Bolingbroke, is not his heir a well-deserving son? What's his point? He's dead. Everything he has should become his. Take Hefford's rights away and take from time his charters and his customary rights. You take Hefford's inheritance away, and what do you do? You destroy the law of inheritance. Does that imply? You destroy the law of inheritance, then you destroy the law that actually made you king. You undercut the ground upon which you live. Now, this is a warning. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself. That is, don't be king if you do this. For how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? Now, for God, as God is my witness, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hefford's rights, call in the letters patents that he hath by his attorney's general to sue his livery, deny his offered homage, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head. Why a thousand? What does he mean? This duke, this duke, this duke, this duke, this baron, this baron, this earl, this earl, everyone who has something because of the right of inheritance is going to turn against you. Because what are you doing? You are turning our entire system of living on its head. I mean, this is, this is dangerous language. Okay? Richard, think what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. It's all mine, he's essentially saying. Okay, we'll stop there. Hey, we got up to Act 2. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely be dropping something. More than likely the sonnets, but I don't want to.